welcome back. Welcome back to the Merge TV, uh, the North American Blockchain Summit. Today we have uh, with us an esteemed uh, goat <laughs> of cryptocurrency. Today we have Fred Thiel, the uh, CEO of Marathon Digital Holdings. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Great. Happy to be here. So you've got such a storied past, HBS grad, uh, public, private, plenty. How did you think you got to do the fireside chat with the RFK? Yep, that was great. Were you here for Vivek as well? Uh, I was here, I heard Vivek speak, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just fascinating to see such a, a, a plethora of talent here in the Dallas area talking about something that everyone thought was all but dead for quite a while. And you, your company has made it through, everyone seems to be hopefully Hopeful, hopefully hopeful. <laughs> yeah, it's ex it's exciting times. You know, a year ago, July, so a year and a half ago, basically, we had zero hash rate running, and here we are, largest miner of the publicly traded miners from a self-mining perspective. Uh, we've now gone global. We have facilities in the UAE and Paraguay and continue to expand. We're focused not just in traditional kind of utility-scale grid stability sites, but we're also now doing energy harvesting with methane from landfill gas. We have a bunch of other projects uh, in kind of taking uh, essentially bio waste and, and methane, turning that into energy, which we then use to create heat from Bitcoin mining, which we then feed back into the process as low grade industrial heat. So heating buildings, heating greenhouses, uh, supporting uh, shrimp farms um, and all sorts of other production processes. So we view Bitcoin mining as really having an industrial function, which is heat generation. Sure. Yeah, and heat sink, and, and as you said, stability and stabilizing the power grids. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and, and so how, you mentioned that you're, you know, global, basically, right? Uh, how was that transition from a, uh, mostly like real estate here in the United States to, to worldwide? Well, it all comes down to working with the right partners. So whenever you're going to do something new, you ideally want to work with the best people possible in the location where you're going. Uh, in the case of UAE, we were going into a country with a very specific set of rules, uh, a specific set of environmental constraints regarding climatology. You know, it's extremely hot, extremely humid. You can't use air-cooled miners. You have to use immersion technology. And then, uh, you know, the only real way to be successful was to partner with the sovereign who obviously has an ownership interest in the power company, the energy distribution business and everything else. And so we were able to um, do a pilot to prove to the sovereign that we could operate in an environment. And we did a one megawatt pilot uh, late last year that ran for a hundred days before an engineer had to go back on site. And they said, okay, this is the most reliable mining system we've seen. And then we were able to um, uh, finalize our agreement with them in February of this year. And here we are barely, you know, eight months later, nine months later, and we've gone live on our 250 megawatts capacity there. So, uh, you know, fascinating kind of deal. When you look at in the U.S., that deal would have taken two years to do. Um, and then Paraguay, again, kind of a big hydroelectric dam using stranded energy. And we're doing a pilot there, and if that works out well, then we'll grow that to also kind of larger scale. Sure. So, in the, I, I've been in the industry a long time, like you, and I've under kind of seen these conversations where, like, you could have a the, you, having a conversation with a sovereign government like that is is wildly speculative and theoretical. Where did it? You've been in this a while. Where did it break towards like reality versus fantasy? Like, you know, the, you know what I'm saying? Like the where did it feel like there was a breakthrough? Like people, uh, these these large uh, organizations took us seriously enough as an industry to even have these conversations about uh, using Bitcoin as a battery and these types of things. Yeah, great question. So um, I wish I could say we were able to convince them of the benefit of doing Bitcoin mining, but they already were orange built before okay. we even talked to them. So they had done two other prior attempts at doing this. And... Um, for technological reasons, those um, deals didn't work out. So they were already orange built. It was just, a, they already got it. You know, they have four gigawatt of power consumption in the summer, one gigawatt in the winter. They still need to run all that power because the water desal uses the heat. So they all of the arguments around grid stability and stranded energy, they were sold on grid. Okay. Right? 
Um, so this is not a, this is a project which has very defined social benefits, very defined economic benefits, uh, and very defined strategic benefits. Right. And so they were looking for the right partner to solve this. They had failed twice mm -hmm. and it was kind of, they had one last chance, one last at bat. And so it went from hypothetical to real when we did the pilot. And right. when they saw the performance of the pilot, it was okay. Now we not just have faith that you could do this, but we have trust because we've seen the data. Right. And then it was all about having a very transparent and very, um, you know, uh, equal level dialogue with them about everything we were doing. So we were sharing about our technology advancements, our investment in Oridine, which is a, a US based minor mm -hmm. yeah. technology company, which um, we were very involved in getting off the ground. I just spoke to him. He was he was just on my show. Yeah, we just chatted. Interesting. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, this industry is really all about how you leverage technology to advance it, right? Because you can only do so many real estate deals around buying power. Now it's advancing to the stage where you have to be have a, a vertically integrated technology stack. You have to be able to operate not just at utility scale with super high efficiency, but also be able to operate at sub utility scale. So one megawatt, two megawatt sites. You know, so stuff we're doing with methane gas capture on landfills, um, the stuff we're doing around energy harvesting where we're collecting uh, using for example, methane or biogas, you feed that into a system that generates heat. The heat generator is a Bitcoin miner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you use that heat and feed it back into an industrial process. That's fast. Right. And so now you're getting to a place where you're not using parasitic load on the grid. So you're using, you're generating your own electricity and that energy is not costing you anything mm -hmm. because you're getting paid to process the material and you're getting paid for the heat. So I, I've only heard this level of complex, you know, recapture design. Like I, I've covered enterprise tech going back to 2009 or so. And uh, only have I heard this like from HP and IBM in their, their, like their, their experimental data labs, you know, the HP you know, research center in Palo Alto. Uh, so within even enterprise, this is kind of rare to attempt this level of like complex systems even so much more so rare in mining. What has been like the driving motivating factor to kind of go for these complex systems? Is it, is it by necessity or by like a, a mission driven focus that you guys have to really make it as green as possible or something? Well, we made a commitment um, two years ago that we were going to be fully carbon neutral in our operation. Okay. And we believe that Bitcoin mining can not only be carbon neutral, but carbon negative. And we also believe that Bitcoin mining can be energy neutral meaning we generate our own energy and we don't have to take load off From the grid. We think that solves for all sorts of issues. Um, also, I've been in tech for 40 years and some of the first work I did in tech was in the supercomputing world uh, and the company I worked with at the time was focused on deploying the industrial control systems for CERN in Switzerland, you know, uh, hmm. Singer Link flight simulator for the F-16. So we were doing very, very sophisticated control technology. And as you look at how technology can change industries, um, it's pretty amazing. I've also spent a lot of time in the industrial automation and mm. process control world through my efforts in IoT, Internet of Things. And you know, this energy harvesting is the perfect example of that. Um, maybe it's my Swedish background. We're very focused <laughs> on the environment and the engineering stuff, but um, you know, we believe that by leading with technology and by leading with a very big focus on green and sustainability, that we're able to differentiate ourselves from everybody else kind of in the industry who's really focused on being big utility scale. Uh, one of the emerging uh, narratives that I, I it's been it's been ruminating around, uh, I think, for a little bit now, but like we've we've talked about it about three or four times on the show this week is the idea that uh, the AI model training system uh, is following a similar track of evolution to Bitcoin data mining, uh, data centers. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Like, is that, is that something you guys are looking at? Is that something you're thinking about? Uh, or do you disagree with that narrative? So maybe chalk this up to having all sorts of battle scars okay. from being an early mover in industries. And just before I kind of answer the question, 
Um, I took a company public back 23 years ago, which was one of the first companies to build embedded communication technologies for IoT systems. So you could essentially connect anything to the internet. Right. Right. We built some of the first technology. The company still exists today. Its name is Lance Um And they still do exactly that. Um, we felt certain in the year 2000 that by 2005, a billion devices would be connected to the internet. I remember that. Everybody was going to have it, right? Here we are, 2023, almost 2024. And I think people are now saying 50 billion devices, and we're still not there. So these things take time. Mm -hmm. The technology goes in waves. You've heard of the theory of S-curve, where sure. you, know, you do an initial. So if you look at AI data centers and you look at Bitcoin mining data centers, what do they have in common? There's only one thing, power density. Right. Right. Bitcoin mining data centers, interruptible load. You can shut them off at any time. If you're running an LLM, you can't shut it off. You need network ping of 35 nanos, milliseconds or less. So you need to be close to a point of presence. The design of your data center in the Bitcoin world, we have tier zero, meaning it's very simple, low complexity. We use containers. We spread containers out over a field. We use immersion technology. Right. Sophisticated, but yeah. low capex. You're talking about something that's, you know, half a million dollars a megawatt of infrastructure. An AI data center is eight to 12 times more expensive to build, just the infrastructure. Now let's start adding H100. By some people's estimates, you're talking $49 million a megawatt wow. when you're all in. Now the H100 is really a first gen machine. The H200 already exists. The H300 will be announced soon. If you build these data centers and you're stocking them with H100s, expecting to have a three-year, four-year contract life on your customer, you've got two things working against you. The guy using the H100 today is going to want to run an H200 tomorrow, and they're going to want to run an H300 the year after that. So what's the likelihood they're going to stick around until you get paid back on all the infrastructure you invested? The next thing is the technology stack in LLMs is changing, so you're now putting vector databases below it. That increases the performance of these LLMs by factors of magnitude. And when you then stack these things, these generative models, and you essentially have them fighting against each other, like GANs work, mm -hmm. right? Right. Now, all of a sudden, you're speeding up this even more. And while the complexity of the models will continue to grow, uh, GPT-4 was, I think, four factors bigger than GPT-3. GPT-5 is about to be announced. And, you know, GPT is effectively writing all the future generations of GPT. Um, the hardware curve has to follow. So as we look at it, we think, you know, initial technology wave, hype cycle, trough of disillusionment, then we go back up and to the right, hopefully. Uh, we're still climbing that hype hill. Right. We haven't gone down to the crash, so we're not chasing this market at all. Okay. Yeah. Other than we are building cooling technology for the industry, leveraging our immersion technology from our Bitcoin data centers, which is applicable to the AI space. And so we're addressing the market that way. Can I pivot the conversation back a little bit to um, money supply, to monetary policy, to cryptocurrency as a, a whole? I, I know that you've been uh, pretty active in the trying to get like you know some basis on institutional uh, adoption, and uh, as it has curve as well, I see that that's also a slow moving shit. I had a conversation with a client of mine who was high level executive at a large insurance company and it was free SBF blow up. And they were this close to saying yes on being able to accept payment for specific policies, so on and so forth. And the problem they had was the comfort of having it on the balance sheet. Right. So if the question is, how has that changed? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I think a couple of things, um, for one thing, um, 
FASB's rule change has a huge impact because now you have the ability to mark to market. So for insurance companies and other institutional holders, um, as a long-lived intangible asset, you can only impair it. It makes it very hard to report actually your returns on your funds and your investments. So by having um, FASB accounting, you have mark to market. So just like any other investment the company has, you mark it up and down based on whatever the current market value is uh, the quarter. That is going to have a huge impact on corporations' ability to store a certain amount of Bitcoin on their balance sheet. But now you need to also fork the conversation a little bit. Bitcoin used as a form of payment is a very different adoption curve, especially in the developed world, right. than Bitcoin as a store of value. Right. As Bitcoin as a network also. So you have right. three very distinct things, right? But Bitcoin as a store of value is where all the institutional action is happening today, right? BlackRock, all these other ETF applications. What's the benefit to having an ETF? Well, you remove all the friction from ownership and acquisition, and you remove the perceived risk of custody. So now it's held by a third party custodian. It's just like you can buy it in your 401k, you can buy it, and now all of a sudden there is an audience that can have it. So the question then comes, how will that drive adoption? Well, most people over the age of 45 aren't interested in crypto. Uh, studies have shown that people over the age of 45, they view it as risky, they read the newspapers, SBF, FTX, don't want anything to do with it. As you move below the age of 45, and the closer you get to 18, the higher the interest and uh, real willingness to invest in Bitcoin as a store of value becomes even so high to the extent that um, Gen Z's and millennials to a lesser extent, but Gen Z's primarily are more willing to invest money into Bitcoin and equities than they are a home. Yeah. Right. They, they have a hard time qualifying for a home. It's sure. an illiquid investment mm -hmm. and they are not tied to a location. They want to be able to rent and move. And so, what that means is they want to have an asset that they can be a digital nomad with. Right. And so Bitcoin and other crypto type investments fit that. And uh, when you have Bitcoin ETFs now, if you are more conservative and less willing to uh, get your own wallet, do self custody, uh, then an ETF is the exact opposite of the spectrum. It's the ultimate kind of safety way, right? right? It's an indirect holding of Bitcoin um, et cetera. Uh, so, but institutional investors had had the option of investing in miners like ourselves right. as an alternative. Why would they want to invest in miners? Well, it's not just that we hold a lot of Bitcoin and Marathon is the second largest holder of Bitcoin to publicly traded companies in the United States, but the beta that we have, it's the same reason Warren Buffett doesn't buy gold. He buys gold miners, right? Right. Bitcoin price moves one or 2%. Our stock price typically will move two, three, four percent. So it's the beta, right? Somebody who's investing in an ETF isn't trading. They're just going to hodl. They're going to put away a certain amount of money every month. So for the four hundred one ks and all the savings and pension funds, I think the ETFs are going to knock it out of the park. And uh, so I think that's going to help adoption there as a currency. I don't see Bitcoin until the tax regime is changed in this country. So you're not paying capital gains every time you buy a bus ticket. Yeah. Right. Plus with the volatility in Bitcoin and its notion as a store of value or connotation as a store of value, I think most people are instead going to say, okay, fine, I'll take my paycheck. I'll put my Bitcoin savings into my Bitcoin account. I'll keep fiat for my spending. Inflation isn't yet high enough in this country to be like in Venezuela right. or other countries where... Mm -hmm between when you get your paycheck and you deposit the check, it's lost 10% of its value. Right, right. So I think a lot of people approach it. And I talk to my own kids who are Gen Zers and millennials. Um, and they say, yeah, I put aside a portion every month into Bitcoin. Yeah. And they have, you know, accounts of like a swan or wherever, right? Yeah. Um, and they just put it aside every month. And so, you know, that's their way of- That's the do it. As Americans, yeah. we live to our reads, we spend all day, but we could also say, Exactly. exactly. To saving. Then you'll have now, if you live in Nigeria, Argentina, Venezuela, you put the whole paycheck, in the world, Turkey, then no, you're putting the whole paycheck into That's Bitcoin. Right. That's right. And then you're converting to dollars or stable coin when you want to spend. Your dollar uh, cost uh, averaging out. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, uh, it's been a fascinating discussion, and I wish we could go on for another hour or so, but I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, this has been a conversation with Fred Thiel here at the North American Blockchain Summit. You're watching The Merge live. We're going to come back with some more stuff after this. Don't go away. Stay tuned. Hey, thanks for watching The Merge. We've got a ton more stuff for you to watch on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, everywhere. Check us out.